Now let's read again Zephaniah 3 verses 6 through 10. It's a lengthy text and it's well worth reading because there are a lot of ideas in it and going over it one more time may help us grasp together its meaning. Zephaniah 3 verses 6 through 10. I have cut off the nations. Their towers are desolate. I made their streets waste that none passeth by. Their cities are destroyed so that there is no man that there is none inhabitant. I said, surely thou wilt fear me. Thou wilt receive instruction so their dwelling should not be cut off. Howsoever I punished them, but they rose early and corrupted all their doings. Therefore wait upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them my indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. For then will I turn to the people a pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughter of my dispersed, shall bring mine offering. The city of Jerusalem, the capital of the southern kingdom, the center of the Old Testament church, is wicked. That's what we heard last week from Zephaniah 3, verses 1 through 5. It was rebellious against the Lord. It oppressed the weak and defenseless members. And so it was polluted. And as I said last week, polluted there means not only filthy before God morally and ethically, but polluted means unclean in the sense that they were totally unable to worship and serve Almighty God. And then the text mentions four deadly sins of omission. Listen out for the word not in verse 2. She obeyed not the voice. She received not correction. She trusted not in the Lord she drew not near to her God. Imagine if you could say that about one member of the church. Imagine if you could say that about the whole congregation. Imagine if you could say that about Israel, which was the only visible church on earth at that time. And as for her church leaders, all classes of them were corrupt. Verses 3 and 4. Her princes, her judges, her prophets, her priests, like, to use the only comparable New Testament analogy I can come up with, like a New Testament church, all of whose pastors, elders, and deacons were not called by God, were wicked men. That's how awful it has become. And despite all that God did, daily keeping the covenant, sending Rain and sunshine upon them, giving them strength each day in his providence, placing his word in the midst, sending out the prophets to proclaim his word to them. Verse 5 said, they knew no shame. They refused even to blush for their wickedness. Instead, they justified them and said, we're basically good people. We're a fair enough church. Zephaniah, you're going over the top. And now our text this morning, Zephaniah 3, verses 6 through 10, continues this theme of the wickedness of Israel and then deals with the wickedness of the nations and then brings salvation to the nations and Israel. Our text contains instruction, a divine lesson in verses 6 and 7. Our text speaks of destruction on the fiery day, that's verse 8, and our text promises conversion, presented especially vividly in the term the pure lip, verse 
verses 9 and 10. You're probably unsure, especially what that last phrase means, but we will see what it all means in due time. Let's hear God's word this morning under the theme instruction, destruction, and conversion. First, the divine lesson. Second, the fiery day. And third, the pure lip. Instruction, destruction, and conversion. The divine lesson, the fiery day, and the pure lip. According to verses 6 and 7, the fundamental problem with Jerusalem is that it doesn't fear God. Despite all the mighty deeds he has done for that nation, recorded from Genesis through Exodus right up to the present time, despite his revelation to her in the sacred scriptures, despite the reading of God's law every seven years at the Feast of Tabernacles, if they were even bothering to do that anymore, and despite the ministry of true prophets who at this time would have numbered such men as Zephaniah himself, Jeremiah, Nahum, and Habakkuk. She doesn't fear God. And so Jehovah declares in three roughly parallel statements in verse 6 the following with respect to the ungodly nation. I have cut off the nation's their towers are desolate. I made their streets waste that none passeth by. Their cities are destroyed so that there is no man, that there is none inhabitant. But did they now, Jerusalem, fear the Lord? No. Verse 6 requires a certain amount of mental envisaging. The nations destroyed. All their fortresses smashed. Their cities reduced to rubble. And the streets empty of its people. The ancient Near East reduced, as it were, to a whole realm of ghost towns. And this is a lesson to the church. Sometimes God's lesson takes this form. He judges the true church, at this time the southern kingdom of Judah centered in Jerusalem. He judges the true church itself for departing from him. He sends famines and plagues or military defeats in order to bring them back to repentance. That's not our text. Sometimes, God punishes the false church, the northern kingdom, which already has been destroyed by this time, in order to warn the true church of its need to repent, with the argument being, if you don't come back to me, you're going to get what they got. That's the argument in Ezekiel 23, or even Jeremiah 3, but not here. In Zephaniah 3, verse 6, the Lord says, not that I'm going to judge, not that I've just judged you, true church, not that I've just judged the false church, but rather, I'm going to judge the world for its sin. I have cut off the nations, verse 6 says, the ungodly pagan, heathen peoples. And that's a lesson to you, southern kingdom, of what I will do to you if you don't fear me. And I want now to underscore how clear and powerful this lesson and warning and example was to Jerusalem from God's destruction of the ungodly world. First, God did not merely destroy one pagan country and say, look, you need to be careful or this will befall you. God punished many of them. All of them in that part of the world. Second, God did not 
merely damage these countries. He destroyed them, all of them. And third, he says, you must understand that the utter destruction of all these countries isn't a matter of chance. It isn't just the case, well, these pagan nations, sure, they're always at each other's throat. They never last that long. They're always killing each other. And this is what they're up to at the minute. Jehovah himself did it. He tells them, I did it. Verse 6, I have cut off the nation. I made their streets waste. Fourth, Jehovah destroyed all these countries personally, exactly as he had predicted. Especially in Zephaniah 2. And then fifth, just to underscore the point, he's saying to Jerusalem and the southern kingdom in general, you, you must understand that you are next in the firing line. This too is prophesied. It's there in chapter 1 of Zephaniah, chapter 2, and chapter 3. Jeremiah has been preaching the same thing as is Habakkuk. And it's going to come upon you for the same reason it came upon them. Sins. And your sins are worse. Because you ought to know better. You're Israel. You're the redeemed people. I've given you my word. And so you should see in this rampaging Babylonian army. That as this nation falls and that nation falls. And as they get closer to you. That you are next in line and that the day of the Lord is approaching for Jerusalem too now learn the lesson wake up open your eyes it's as clear as day to you or it ought to be so how did they respond did they fear the Lord no they willfully ignored it you say that's crazy these people are nuts yeah they are spiritually well, did they restrain themselves a bit? No. The passage makes it quite clear that they just kept on their sins. Well, did they decide, well, we're not going to repent and we're not going to restrain ourselves, but at least we're, we should stop getting worse? Did they do that? No. Verse 7 says, They rose early and corrupted all their doings. That is, unlike our children, for school on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday morning, trying to hang on in bed as long as possible, what they did was, I need to get up, I need to get up and get stuck into my sins. And then, as if their deeds weren't entirely corrupted in every sphere, they said, and I need to sin more and more, I need to sin in this area and that area, and just get worse and worse and worse. Right? All this instruction, so clear, so evident, Instruction upon instruction, and their response is the worst possible response. And this is where Jehovah's bold anthropomorphism comes in. I'll explain that word in a minute. Verse 7 begins, I said, now with regard to all the judgment upon the pagan nations, I said, surely thou wilt fear me, thou wilt receive instruction. And it's as if God is here saying, well, I don't know what they're going to do, but they're bound to repent. It's as if God's saying, forget about my decree. It's as if I don't know what the future is, but surely this is going to be enough for them so that they will turn from their evil ways and they'll actually start fearing me for a change. And that's a startling way of speaking. It's an anthropomorphism. Anthropo, from the word in Greek, for man. It's God speaking as if he were a man. As if he were a man, for instance, who was disciplining his son, and disciplined him really, really sharply, and said after disciplining his son, or even more closely, after really badly disciplining, well, say, a servant, that my son who sees this, he's going to shape up. He's bound to. Surely he will now fear me and receive instruction. It's as if God is saying that. 
that this example of his destruction of the heathen is so clear and terrible that that's bound to be enough to make Jerusalem fear. But it wasn't. But it wasn't. They were that wicked, and so from every perspective, they must be punished. And you think to yourself, you know, that's one of those instances in the Old Testament whereby Israel is so wicked that there's no way that could apply to the church today. See, Israel, they're a particular sort of false church and ungodly people. But in our day, I mean, we're in the 21st century. The churches are pretty good. Everybody's fairly nice. And it would take even a really sharp and extreme minister to say that this sort of thing goes on today. Well, think again. Think again. Think of what happened in World War II, and especially now the liberal, rotten churches in Europe, as most of them were really liberal, really rotten. And they were talking about how good man was. Well, the kingdom of God's going to come on earth. And we're building this wonderful civilization. And the whole world is going to be just great. And then along came Hitler, and Europe was plowed up. And you would have thought that they would have said to themselves, look, this is where our higher criticism of Scripture has gotten us. This is where our liberal theology shows itself to be a total lie. This is where our belief in the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of men and that people are basically good and total depravity is a myth from the Dark Ages. That was the problem with the Dark Ages. They didn't really believe in total depravity. But what was their solution? After World War II ended, they stuck with the same rotten theology And they said, you know what we need? We need more ecumenism. We need to get closer to the Church of Rome. We need to scrap all our doctrines and get together and that will make the world a better place. You think to yourself, you've learned nothing. Nothing. Think of what happened on September 11. That building went up in flames. People were appalled. Some people even thought of hell, as they should have with the flames. And what was their solution? Well, there were several. But what was the main one in the church? You know what we need to do? We need to get closer to our Muslim brothers. We need to engage in more ecumenical activity and joint prayer meetings and really see how much in common we have with them. Earthquakes come. God sends them. And here's a cry from the Almighty to wake up. You need to repent and we're not now talking about the world now, we're talking about the false church. You need to repent of your rejection of biblical creation and all your forms of theistic evolutionism. The evolution is basically true. and God helped it along and gave it the odd nudge every now and again. And what do the false churches say? You can even see their spokesman in the news every now and again talking about this. Mother nature. Mother nature. See, our planet's millions and millions of years old and then it heats and cools and things move and earthquakes and... <sighs> Well, we need more relief funds. That's the best they can come up with. In the last several years, we've seen what many call extreme weather, both here and in other parts of the world. What do they do? Do they say, well, maybe this is the sort of thing spoken of in the seals or the trumpets or the vials in the book of Revelation? No, the churches say, global warming. Climate change. What we need is not to start fearing the Lord. What we need is more taxation. Is that the best the church can do? Can't anything shake it out of its basically secular humanist mindset? Hasn't it got a word from God? Isn't it going to fear him or repent? No. Think even of the massive losses in church membership. Picture a graph of church attendance in Europe or the British Isles for all the historic Protestant churches. Such graphs go over the last few years and decades, and this is clear even going further back, such graphs go, go like this. And they're getting what they deserve. And you say to them, look, now this is where your gospel has gotten you. You've left the bread from heaven. You're no longer giving the people the water of life. 
the gospel of justification by faith alone, in Christ alone, by the sovereign grace of God alone, as recorded in scripture, you've jettisoned that. But surely now you must fear God and go back to it. Surely you must realize that your churches were doing well, even in terms of attendance, when you preach the gospel of God. And what they say is, no, no, we're losing more members. We simply need to be trendier. We need to appeal more to the young people. We need less of the word of God. We need to shorten the sermons. And we need to do things what everybody wants. To look at it from another angle, the Bible talks about the signs of the times. Precursors of the coming of Jesus Christ and the end of the world. Signs that prepare for and lead up to the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Such signs are apostasy in the churches, the love of many waxing cold, war and rumors of war, earthquakes, famines and diseases. And these are the things that are in the newspapers, not the back section, which is the sport, or the middle section, which is housing, but the front of it. Every day, if you took these things out of what's going on in the world, your newspapers would consist of nothing but ads. But instead, what do they say? Well, God's doing nothing in the world. Can't see what's as clear on the nose of their face. And this is what the Institute Church is saying. Will these things happen? After all, we live in an evolutionary world. What we need is not to repent and get back to the Lord. We need the government to take more action and become bigger and tax us more and regulate more and more parts of our lives. That's what the church is saying. So just like the world, which is aping, and just like Israel in the Old Testament in Zephaniah 3, the departing church learns neither from history nor from current events, because it's not learning from the word. It fails to learn from all the examples and the warnings. And what does it do? It gets worse. It rises up early to corrupt all things. We need an even more liberal theology. We need to embrace all the ethics of the world. And whatever they're saying next, we will say next behind them. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And moving near to home, do we learn anything from the signs of the times? Or are the newspapers simply just the news? Just what's happening and we don't even read them biblically and we don't repent. We don't think about the return of Christ. We're basically secular in our attitudes and approaches like the ungodly world. Do we take instruction from God's judgments that are in the earth and are we preparing and are we ready for the day of the Lord? And that brings us to the day of the Lord. In Zephaniah 3 verse 8, which is the last verse in the book that speaks about the day of the Lord upon the ungodly nations or even the day of the Lord upon the departing church. That day is described in verse 8 as a day of gathering. A day of gathering. My determination, says the Almighty, is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms. The Babylonian army picked off the pagan nations one by one. The Moabites and the Ammonites and the Assyrians and the Philistines mentioned in Zephaniah 2 and the others. But here it's as if God just destroyed them through the Babylonians together. Heaped them all in one big pile and ruined them. That day is a day of gathering. That day is a day of plunder. The text uses the word prey. The day that I rise up to the prey. And the word prey can mean the prey of an army 
which then is plunder or spoil, when you defeat your enemy, you take all his wealth. <coughs> That's what's been happening in war for thousands of years. Or prey can refer to that which is captured by a carnivorous animal. Well, here it's dealing with prey in the sense of plunder or spoil. And the Babylonians took prey, that is plunder or spoil, when they devastated the nations in the ancient Near East. But since God wrought through the Babylonians and they were his rod of judgment, the text speaks as if God himself were rising up to take the plunder or spoil so that the nations on this day of plunder would lose everything. A day of gathering, a day of plunder, a day of wrath. Verse 8 God speaks of mine indignation, my fierce anger, my jealousy. Words and images like those in chapter 1, verses 15 and 18. God even says in verse 8, I will pour upon them mine indignation. As if God's indication were a liquid in a huge vessel. Think now of the vials in the book of Revelation that you could tip so as to pour upon all these nations the wrath of God. I will pour upon them my indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured or consumed with the fire of my jealousy. This is God's holy and righteous anger against the wicked nations. And what is the calling of God's people regarding this day of gathering, plundering, and wrath. Verse 8 says, Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the plunder. And the argument here is that the people of Israel will not repent and be spared, despite the judgments clear before their eyes and all the surrounding pagan nations despite the preaching of Zephaniah and others they're not going to repent and since they're not going to repent and be spared the best that they can do and this really refers to the elect remnant in their midst is simply wait that day will certainly come it can't be avoided the best you can do is just wait for it or better yet Wait upon me. Receive strength and grace from me each day because this judgment will not be revoked. This is a similar idea to that which we saw earlier in chapter 2 verse 3. The judgment is coming. It can't be stopped. Therefore, seek ye the Lord. All the meek of the earth which have wrought his judgment, the remnant who truly believe in me, in the midst of wicked Jerusalem. Seek ye the Lord. Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. It may be that when that judgment comes in Jerusalem in the 6th century BC, you won't be slaughtered. He will hide you in the day of anger. Now you're going to go to heaven, all right, as one of God's people, but maybe he'll give you a special earthly favor that you will survive the cataclysm. That's all there is in the 6th century so. And because of what we've seen earlier in this series, in terms of the prophetic blending between the judgment in the 6th century BC, that historical devastation, and the second coming of Jesus Christ to punish the wicked, you will understand that verse 8 applies not only to the day of the Lord 2,500 years in the past for us, but also to the day of the Lord Jesus Christ that is future to us. The two images are blended like they are in Isaiah 13 and 14 and Matthew 24, etc. And we can say too 
about the day of the Lord Jesus Christ at the end of history, that that day is, to take the exact same terms we saw earlier, it's a day of gathering. This is Joel 3, verses 12 and 13. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, which means Jehovah judges. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Let them be wakened, let them come together, let them be gathered. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. You know what a sickle does? Movement like this, to harvest the, the grain. Come, get you down, for the press is full. The fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Now it's the harvest of grapes. You throw them in and you trample upon them and they overflow with the red blood of the grape. They're all gathered together for the judgment day and the lake of fire. It's a day of gathering the last day. It's a day of plunder when all the wicked will lose all their houses and all their land and all their wealth and everything they enjoyed and trusted in when they will lose, in a word, everything. A day of gathering of the wicked, a day of plunder, and a day of wrath. We saw that Zephaniah 3 verse 8 speaks of God's indignation, fiery anger, and jealousy. Similar words are used in Romans 2, 8 and 9. Here is God's promise. Unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, I will meet upon them indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. In describing this imagery of wrath, as indignation, anger, jealousy, fire imagery is used. The fire of my jealousy. The fire of his jealousy, it's called in the third person in chapter 118. A day of wrath, a day of fiery wrath. Does that ring a bell? The New Testament teaching on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ is that he will come with fire to burn up the world. Second Peter 3.10 The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, suddenly, unexpectedly, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, <coughs> plundered. <coughs> Verse 12 continues, looking for and hasting on to the coming of the day of God, the day of God, verse 12, the day of the Lord, verse 10, wherein the heavens being on fire, how do you put the heavens into fire? The heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fire fervent heat. And so the calling of God's people regarding that day of gathering and plunder and wrath and fire is wait. Wait. Looking for and hastening onto the coming of the day of God. Second Peter talks about. A waiting that is patient you don't begin to panic. Oh, it hasn't come in the last five years. Maybe the promise of Scripture isn't true. A waiting that is persevering, you don't give up. A waiting that is purifying, because everyone who has this hope in the second coming of Jesus Christ purifies himself, even as Christ is pure. A waiting characterized by longing. It's a great good that's coming for the believer. Because we're going to be with Jesus Christ, the one who died for our sins, the Lord whom we love, and we're going to honor and glorify God like we've never been able to do 
perfectly in this world. And now what about after? What about beyond the day of the Lord in the 6th century BC? Not, a, not a, after and beyond the second coming of Jesus Christ, but after and beyond the day of the Lord in the 6th century BC. We read, for then, first time, will I turn to the people of pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. There's one little interpretation factor that explains the verse, puts us on the right track. It's that word people. People can serve as a collective noun. You could talk about all the people of the world. That's billions of people. But for us, we should note that the Hebrew is in the plural. It means peoples, the Gentiles, the nations, as opposed to Israel or Judah or the southern kingdom. God says, I will turn to the people a pure language. And another little interpretive thing, the word language is lip. I will turn to the people a pure lip, hence the third point of the sermon. This promise, I will turn to the peoples a pure lip, is not that the Jews will learn Hebrew again, as they did in large numbers in the new state of Israel in the 20th century. And I say that because some, like the Billy Graham evangelistic people, said, Zephaniah 3 verse 9 prophesied that a lot of people would learn Hebrew and it's come to pass in our day. You see, the Bible's true. Well, the Bible is true and the Bible ought to be interpreted properly. It's not saying anything about Hebrew. The text doesn't mention Hebrew. It says, I will turn to the peoples a pure language. And when it says peoples, plural, it's actually not even talking about the national Jews. It's referring to the Gentiles. And lip Though you use your lip to speak, you also use it to eat, but though you use your lip to, to speak is referring to godly speech in whatever language. And this passage is saying that in the future, after the judgment of the 6th century BC, and it doesn't tell you how soon after the judgment of the 6th century BC, God will give to the Gentile nations a pure lip. So they're going to stop talking about their idols and singing praise to statues and they're going to cease uttering profanations and filthy things and they're going to speak the truth in love. Not the Jews or even the Gentiles are going to learn Hebrew. By all means you can learn Hebrew if you like but it's not going to take you into heaven by itself. And this is talking about salvation. <laughs> And when it says that the Gentiles, the nations, are going to speak with a pure lip, as Calvin points out in the bulletin, it doesn't mean everybody in the nations. It means the elect in Jesus Christ, those who are redeemed by his blood, those who are called by his spirit from all nations. They will speak with a pure lip. And the proper use of this pure lip is explained further in verse 9, so that they pray to the one true God. I will turn to the peoples, the Gentiles, the nations, a pure lip that they may all call upon the name of the Lord. This language is used in Joel 2 and Romans 10. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Even the Gentiles, even the nations. And they will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God has raised him up from the dead and they will be saved. And these Gentile converts with the pure lip, now speaking God's truth because they believe it in their heart, will pray to him for salvation and seek his face in communion with the Lord. The passage goes on to say that they're going to serve Jehovah, all these hostile 
nasty, blaspheming, <coughs> pagan Gentiles. They're going to serve the Lord as his willing and obedient slaves by his grace. They're going to serve the Lord as citizens of the heavenly kingdom. They're going to serve the Lord as worshippers, prophets and priests and kings. And they're going to serve him, these Gentile converts, with one consent. And the word consent means literally shoulder. All the Gentiles all around the world, they're going to serve the Lord with one shoulder. And what do you do with your shoulder? Well, in general, and specifically in the Bible, you use your shoulder to carry, to lift, to carry and lift burdens. So that all the Gentile converts are going to lift one burden together. The nearest thing I could think of in this regard to people today with one consent and one shoulder lifting someone is really a coffin. One time you get six men walking fairly closely with a shoulder, typically six, but they've got one shoulder lifting. And the idea here is the unity of Christ's Catholic, that is, universal church, a unity in the church which involves a unity not only in, in doctrine or in prayer, but a unity in service to God, a unity in service in the church which is hard service, with one shoulder. And you think to yourself, well, that's a lovely image. A lovely image for this congregation in which everybody in the church serves the Lord. And not just, well, I like to do things for the church, but I don't want to spend too much time on it. And I want something nice and easy. And preferably, I want something kind of showy so that I can do this and be seen to be doing this. And I want to do something that's not that hard, it doesn't take that much time, it's quite showy, and then I can, look at me, look what I've just done. That's not the sort of service that the Bible talks about, or that this text talks about, because this text talks about work that involves labor, burden, hard stuff, and doing it with one shoulder, so that everybody operates together, you knock out one guy, think how this would go if you were carrying a, a coffin in a funeral, and he, he's lifting with a right shoulder, kind of like this. That is, he's not actually carrying anything at all, but he looks as if he's carrying something. But the guy in front of him, and to the right side of him, he has to take all the more. This passage speaks of the church's unity in its work, with no shirkers, one shoulders, nobody selfish. He's saying, I think I've done enough. Why doesn't he do something? And no slacking off. Well, so-and-so said this to me. And since he said this to me, well, I'm just not going to bother doing anything in the church. Sounds to me like an attitude problem. Or I did this, and nobody, nobody here really seemed to thank me. You need to examine yourself while you're doing it. You don't primarily do anything in the church for anybody. You do it for the Lord's sake. And Matthew 6 tells of how we are to do our work, not to be seen of men, not to be praised by men. Just do it for you serve the Lord. And then you're going to be far more richly, far more richly rewarded than if everybody in the church patted you on the back going out of a worship service and said, Great, great. Whatever you do to do serve the Lord and to be quiet, you get rewarded far, far more. <coughs> and the point about this text that ought not be missed is that this is monergism. That is, it's the work of God alone. The text says, verse 9. Then will I turn to the people. I will do this. I will do this alone. I will do this as a work of grace. I will do this through the miracle of regeneration. I will turn to the people. And I will give them all. Every last one of them. The entire elect church. I'll give them one pure lip. So that they call upon the name of the Lord for salvation. And through their life and fellowship with me. So that they all together serve me. With one shoulder. I will do this. And guess what? That is exactly what he has done. This is the faithfulness of God. The day of the Lord in the 6th century BC. He was faithful. It happened. The pagans were destroyed. Jerusalem the departing church. 
crumbled into ruins. And then, as we have seen too, for 2,000 years, verse 9 in God's faithfulness has been fulfilled. The conversion of the Gentiles, the gathering of the Catholic Church. And the other thing that this passage says is going to happen, it's going to happen too. The day of the Lord Jesus Christ. For the Lord is faithful. Briefly, and in closing, verse 10, our last verse, is a parallel promise to that of verse 9. Because it too speaks about prayer, calling upon the name of the Lord. That's the language of verse 9 with a pure lip. Verse 10 talks about my suppliants. And suppliants are those who supplicate, that is those who pray to the living God. This passage talks about service. Verse 9 talks about serving with one shoulder, so we're all keeping up the burden together. Verse 10 talks about serving God by bringing a pure offering to him in gratitude and service. Only verse 10 doesn't speak about the Gentiles as verse 9 does, although it may do, I'll come back to that thought. Verse 10 talks about the Jews. Verse 10 talks about the daughter of my dispersed. This refers to the Jews who were dispersed or scattered when God came and destroyed Jerusalem. And the daughter of my dispersed, female, fits with the whole imagery of the city of Jerusalem as female. Dispersed through the capture and destruction of Jerusalem. A dispersal even as far as Ethiopia, which as I said earlier, means Cush, which is in today's geography more nearly akin to Sudan, which is south of Ethiopia. And that's a big dispersal. That's a huge scattering. And so verse 10 is saying, For from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, these are tributaries of the Nile, my suppliants, even the daughter of my dispersed, people of Jerusalem, who have been scattered at the fall of Jerusalem, shall bring mine up. They're all going to come back. Oh, the elect ones. They're going to come back. We saw in chapter 2, verse 12, the day of the Lord meant destruction for Ethiopia. Sudan. And now the same terminology used in an oracle of salvation in chapter 3, verse 10. The day of the Lord in the 6th century has come and gone. Though we're keen to learn its lesson. And after that, the Gentile peoples, verse 9, a pure lip, serving him, praying to him. And the Jews of verse 10, the Jews of the dispersion, although it may well be the Jewish dispersion so far scattered, it may even sort of include Gentiles coming in there too, but we'll pass that. But it certainly means this together. The salvation of the Jews and the Gentiles in the Catholic Church of Jesus Christ. And that's where we are today. And the day of the Lord Jesus is coming. Wait. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, as thy supplicants and those with pure lip, we call upon thy name, thankful for thy word which sheds light upon our path, and praying thee that thou would stir up our hearts, that we may repent of our sins, that we may learn of thy fearful judgments upon the world and upon the false church, and even chastisements upon us, that we may be ready and eager and longing for the return of Jesus Christ and the new world. For we ask this in his name. Amen.